The Creative Embroidery Association of Sydney is an exclusive group with a membership of just over 30. Each year a travelling exhibition features the group's colourful works and this year the theme is Coats Exotic and Amazing. There are 10 pieces on display and all are representative of advanced embroidery work. The coats are designed by hand or machine, some combining both techniques. All are on display until tomorrow evening. The Cookfield Gallery is also showing the latest exhibition by acclaimed Australian landscape artist Graham Cox. The paintings feature some of the country's most spectacular scenic spots, including the Warren Bungles and a little closer to home, the Barrington Tops. Cox the artist has a fascination with the changing and varied qualities of the Australian landscape. His exhibition will allow the public to appreciate his works until July the 7th. about the CAE's nursing program. In between the grocery shopping, you can have your height, weight, pulse and blood pressure readings taken. And if they're above or below normal, then there's an array of literature to help rectify the situation. The idea is to get the training nurses out of the classrooms and into the community, a scheme which student Linda Bernard agrees with. Well, we're take, learning how to take blood pressures, which we're normally taking which at the um, back at the college that most people are fit. So out here there people got high blood pressure, low blood pressure. So you're sort of learning the different types that's where you can get. Subjects like home science and textiles have been regarded as non-academic, but it's a different story for more than 400 students at the CAE today now preparing for complex exams. Travelling from schools throughout the Hunter Valley, the Central Coast, Mid-North Coast and New England, the students attended a series of lectures on topics as diverse as food science, nutrition, the Australian textile industry and fabric design. It's the fourth year that the special seminars have been held, giving the students expert advice as Organiser Faith Trent explains. They're basically getting the experts talking about their expertise. Really we see this as being an enrichment day, a day in which the sorts of things that teachers can't provide because they don't work in detail in all of these areas can be provided by people who are actually living and working in the fields and also have very good academic qualifications. The newly elected president of the Hunter Medical Association, Dr Gabor Major, says the government's move appears aimed at some less than ethical operators in the field. Well, I don't know all the details of what went into the uh, decision, <coughs> but I presume one of the aspects was that they were trying to curtail some of the alleged pathology service abuses that uh, have happened in the past and presumably may still be happening. It would seem, though, that in that intent, if that was their intent, they may not succeed too well because the people who will be uh, taking the brunt of the effect actually are the ethical services. And the entrepreneurs and others, I think, will be able to continue to circumvent the, uh, the new rulings. One practice whose ethics and integrity are quite beyond any question is Hampson Schweitzer Barker Roberts, which recently moved into new headquarters at Katara. The practice operates seven laboratories in the coastal strip between Gosford and Grafton and it's widely reported that one of those laboratories is to close and the operations at the remaining ones will be scaled down and there'll be the loss of up to 80 jobs amongst the 450 people currently employed. All as a direct result of this latest decision by the government.
The falling Australian dollar over the past 18 months has added to the problems, with expensive equipment and testing reagents having to be imported. While principals of this practice would not agree to be interviewed, I was told that rationalising can only go so far. You can improve your efficiency up to a point, but beyond that, retrenchments have to take place. But what effect will all this have on the public? The HMA's Dr Major. Well, the public may unfortunately see that in some cases they have to pay more for their pathology services. In other circumstances, perhaps, they may find it more difficult to have certain tests done. It is difficult to predict in advance just what will happen, but that may well be one outcome. development costs have been met without the need to borrow money. The council says that further development costs will be marginal and should be paid for by money made from land sales. Shire President Councillor Roy Taylor admits that the largest single factor in the department's decision to hand back control of the project is the sale of the shopping centre site for one point six million dollars. you off the hook? I think it's proved the fact that Salamander is viable and it certainly made a difference to the sales within the Salamander project because since the actual commercial site has commenced we've averaged something like one sale per week which uh, perhaps a little better than that at the present time but I think the fact now that we've been given the green light to go ahead uh, and complete Salamander without referring to back to the department other than for loan monies vindicates council's decision from its original move. The shopping centre with its shoey supermarket and 24 specialty stores should be completed by October, Richard Owens, the managing as well the council is now assessing a proposal to a develop a motel near ever. the town centre and is looking at developing new residential sites near the waterfront. Despite more than 12 months of harsh local opposition... Tenders for the $8 million project to construct a duplicate lifting span bridge and connecting road close on the 3rd of September. The project is expected to be awarded in November with a completion date of 1988. The Tradesville Council will meet on Thursday and is expected to discuss the issue, especially in light of the recent meeting at Swansea to gauge public feeling. The Tradesville Council has supported those Swansea and Caves Beach residents who want a high level bridge. According to member for Swansea, Don Bowman, the current economic climate eliminates a more expensive alternative crossing. But he also says there is no chance of funds for the project drying up because of recent forecasts of possible cutbacks in state spending. Meantime, the Transport Workers' Union, also a supporter of the high-level crossing, will reassess its stance at an executive meeting on July the 7th. The TWU could also reconsider its position because of the lack of alternatives in the current economic climate. The Florida oh, crash happened on Monday. The TV crew doing a live cross to the studio we'll on traffic conditions simply fell out of the air from an altitude of 70 metres. She died in the crash, the pilot along with and the, the pilot, journalists William were killed. Smith, the cameraman Brett was seriously was injured. Was Central Coast condition. Identity and Screws Air founder Joe Screws heard of the accident, to 200 but feet in it wasn't until late fell. last night Julie King that a telephone was call from the television station in Florida revealed that the helicopter involved, a Hughes 500C, had once been owned and operated by he and his son, the late Joe Screws Jr., as a rescue service. He says he was deeply upset about the link. And immediately his memory flashed back to Monday, March the 24th, 1980, when the same helicopter, returning from a rescue operation with five people on board, toppled over while landing at the Gosford heliport. No one was seriously injured in that crash, although the helicopter was damaged beyond repair. Joe says he decided to ship it to a Los Angeles firm, Helimart, which specialised in selling damaged choppers. It was sold to a Florida drugs bounty hunter, Captain Keith Mackey, and fully restored. 
Later again, it was sold to the television station WTLV TV. Joe says a seized a swashplate bearing in the rear rotor was responsible for the 1980 Gosford crash, but he doubts whether a reason for Monday's double fatality will ever be known. He is sure, now, however, that any damage road, done to the craft know, in the Gosford school nice, would well, have I contributed said, when they to Monday's like accident. This. Yes, I would have trusted, especially if it's it's gone through the correct channels in maintenance uh, workshop, the engineering of it. Uh, the airframe wasn't that bad. Thousands of people all roped up against the night air lined the foreshores of Carrington Slipways to see the Sandra Marie take to the water for the first time. After the speeches came the traditional blessing for a long life at sea. Then the moment the huge crowd had been waiting for. It was up to another Sandra Marie, this time Sandra Marie Cadwallader, to cut the ribbon to send her namesake gracefully down the slips into the dark water. And after a few anxious moments, the Sandra Marie was on the way. The Rosellas moved into second spot alone on the Indian ladder by beating Curry Curry this afternoon at Harker Oval New Lambton. But as a result, the Bulldogs now share fifth spot with Macquarie United. West, though, have had to struggle to win two of their last three games after losing two matches three weeks back. At one stage in the middle of the second half, it was on again. The teams were locked at 14 all. But Western Suburbs came good in the late stages. In all, they got four tries, one to each of John Holbert, Greg Egar, Craig Higgins and Wayne Yu, with four from five to Greg Egar in goal kicks. Curry Curry scored two tries to Brad Hopes and Craig Wyburn, with four goals from five attempts also to hook up for Williams. I'm Karen Lemming. Here at Glendale Tech, a participation and equity course in airbrushing and car detailing is achieving great success for young unemployed women. Not only are the girls producing artwork like this, 50% of them will start work in new jobs on Monday. Join Ray Deneen and Anna Manzoni for all the news tonight at 6. business and so forth, mm. he, um, but you're not tagging it, you? No, no, they no, can't hear a word we're saying. Yeah. Business. Um, he finds five years. Well, I have other activities involved in other activities that take me away from Newcastle quite a bit, and um, I find that to combine the two would be impossible. I wouldn't be doing the right duty to the council. And what about John? Well, he has increased the business um, ability quite a lot, and um, there's an outreach going on there that will take a lot of his time and to devote five years more to it would be, would be really excluding him from standing for that reason. And both of you have also resigned from the citizens group. What's behind that? Well, we find that the citizens group does no longer have the ability to work as an independent group. The whole structure of it in the beginning was to have a group of independent people working as a group to be able to think and vote according to their conscience. Now since that 
is no longer there and they are just merely another political party, we don't fit into that. Charlestown is the 28th area in the Newcastle Police District to be involved with Neighbourhood Watch. Last night's meeting was organised by the Charlestown Residents Action Group and showed the continuing support for this successful community policing initiative. Since its introduction to the Newcastle area, Neighbourhood Watch has achieved its best result in Woodbury, where there's been a 90% reduction in crime. And the further 10 suburbs are planning to introduce Neighbourhood Watch. Last night, a liaison committee was elected to help coordinate the scheme's operation. And Steve King from Police Community Relations says the Neighbourhood Watch program is continuing to prove its work. Policing? Yes, they're responding well to the community policing concept. Police are receiving better information and more involvement from the community. The community are responding to crime when they see it by calling the police via Triple R and giving their name, address and the nature of what happened. So this community policing concept is changing attitudes, people's attitudes to how they see police as well? Most definitely. We're receiving a lot more assistance. The community are realising the police force in New South Wales are there to serve them. Although the new ward has only one patient now, it can take up to four aid sufferers, with around-the-clock care provided by a social worker, an infection control sister, two doctors, a pool of up to 12 specially trained nursing staff who work in the ward on a voluntary basis, and one wardsman. The rising incidence of AIDS is reflected in the growing number of sufferers, even in the Hunter. Two have died so far, one of those last week. Three are now suffering the full symptoms of AIDS and are being cared for in the community. 25 are now showing the initial signs and an estimated 5,000 in the Hunter area are known to be carrying the AIDS antibody. Clinical Director of the Hunter Immunology Unit, Dr David Sutherland, says a major problem is the number of bisexual men in the area who will not admit to their homosexual encounters. Dr Sutherland says it's these people that run a major risk in spreading the disease into the community. There is no prospect for a vaccine. There is no drug which will eradicate the virus, although we're hopeful that before too long there will be drugs which will slow the virus down. All we have left is education. Stop people getting the virus is all we have. Is education achieving anything? No, we're doing our best, but it's not working. And if you look at the graphs, up, up, up go the incidence of AIDS. That means we're failing. The hospital has now released the first of five videos on AIDS which will be available for community education and specially recorded information on AIDS is available through the Royal Newcastle Hospital's AIDS hotline on 266 doubles as her studio. When conference organiser Barbara Allen visited today, they discussed the theme of the conference, Survival and Practice. The Gita has survived by painting a series of murals around Newcastle, including those at Fort Scratchley, the Civic Playhouse and Dairy Farmers Corner, but even she has found the going tough. According to Barbara, who is the executive officer of the New South Wales Community Arts Association, the average professional artist in Australia earns less than $10,000 a year. She says this is unfair, considering the major contribution the industry makes to the economy. For example, in the 10 years to 1981, employment grew by 52%, and now 120,000 people are employed as artists, craftspeople, and associated technicians and administrators. Barbara says the arts is a growth industry that deserves more public the money and private be funding. Well, we're involved in community arts. We think that we're developing a new art, which is art for, for people and involving people. We think for that reason that there should be greater public funding and our industry should be greater, greater supported through the public means. Also, the private sector really should get involved.
Detective Inspector Ross Morrison has spent the last 18 months establishing the Newcastle-based Regional Crime Squad. In that time, the squad has achieved a high level of crime reduction and an enviable arrest record. Ross Morrison says the Newcastle Police District will continue to play an important role in crime prevention in the future. The Commissioner and, and uh, Assistant Commissioner Nixon are uh, considering adjuncts to this squad uh, probably at Coffs Harbour or Lismore, but they will be answerable to the Chief Inspector in charge here. Head of the Sydney CIB, Chief Superintendent Bob Bradbury says the Newcastle-based Regional Crime Squad has had great success in its short time of operation. Well, but I suppose the most spectacular successes have been in the area, uh, a very worrying area for us, of arson investigation. I think there's something like 26 people have been arrested by the Regional Crime Squad at Newcastle with the local detectives and uniformed police in that period and that really uh, represents well over 60% in the rate of clear-ups of known arson offences. So we're very, very pleased with that result. Music ever written. With sponsorship from CSR, the coming season of 